Um, hello, my name is Sabrina. And my name is Samantha. Welcome to Orchard Park, home of Team 2056. If you have any questions about the day, where our session is, or where the bathrooms or cafeteria is, we can help. So I'd like to introduce Chris and Brendan, and they are going to be talking about managing luck and improving your FRCR. So we see a, a lot of uh, faces from the previous presentation. We've got a bit of overlap uh, between that, coincidental, I assure you. Um, so I'm Chris. Um, I am a lead teacher mentor <coughs> on uh, 5406. Uh, I teach Chris Bryan, a uh, bit of a mixed bag of subjects, physics, a little bit of computer engineering, uh, and some other sciences as uh, whatever I get each semester. Uh, I'm Brendan Simons, I'm a professional engineer, um, uh, lead, one of the lead managers uh, at Celtex. Uh, just before we get going and before we start, start talking about the meat of it, I kind of want to understand the audience. So, um, how many, do we have any rookies in the audience? Like any rookie team? Fantastic. Rookie plus one. Rookie plus one account, sure. Um, uh, and uh, do we have any uh, veteran teams? I'm going to say veteran more than five years old. Okay. All right. So, um, so we're definitely going to keep uh, a focus on uh, a lot of uh, rookie form things, but um, but we'll also talk about. Uh, well, we'll also actually want to hear from you guys, the, the experienced teams who've had more experience than we do. Yeah, for sure. If you have questions as we go along, please don't hesitate to just raise a hand and let us know. Uh, so. We're going to chat a little bit about, so FRC seems to have a lot of the element of luck in it. We've only got a few games, and somehow or the other, some teams seem to manage to overcome the odds of luck, and we're proposing that there's more to it than just luck, and that you can maybe have some control over, over that destiny in some of these matches. Uh, so as we said, we're uh, part of uh, 5406. Um, we've only been around for five years. Uh, it's been a, an awesome ride for five years for us. Um, we. Done, we've won a few things, um, but uh, more than that, we've, we've grown a lot as a team. Uh, in five years, we've gone from working out of a school, having hand tools, to running CNCs, and having kids design and build the robots as a summer project. So it's a lot of change in five years. Uh, but things haven't been perfect along the way, so our goal with this presentation is to show uh, some of the lessons we've learned. I think that's our superpower as a team, is that whenever something doesn't go right, uh, we figure out how to make it go right the next time. Uh, and we'll talk about some of those examples uh, and keep the presentation interesting by showing those during the talk. Yeah, so what we really want you to take away is uh, some, some general strategies, but there are some specific examples throughout um, of things that we have done when things didn't work, um, which are things that people can actually use on their robots or as part of their team. Yeah, and before we go on to the next one, I guess uh, our... Our goal with managing luck, our team goal, is, is always competitive success. Um, so we, a lot of these examples are ways to make the robot perform better, but um, they may not be your goal, and I think some of these techniques apply uh, for administrative uh, success, uh, for morale, uh, for just making the system work as a business. So uh, even though we're talking a lot about performance, uh, don't necessarily get focused on that. Okay, sorry, we're moving on. We have 35, we have 35 slides. <laughs> we're about two minutes a slide. All right, <coughs> you sir. All right, uh, so FRC has uh, a, a pretty wide range of things that are going on. We have a lot of people, we have a lot of teams competing, they're all trying to do the same thing, and you're not gonna see the same teams every year, you're not gonna see the same people on your team every year, so somehow you need to counteract all of this between years. Uh, you have to have these same ideas kind of uh, transition from one year to another and be kind of part of your team culture. Oh, okay, you want both slides? Yeah. Sure. We haven't actually had a chance to rehearse this very much. Uh, so FRC is, is difficult. There's a lot of things that have to come together. Uh, there's uh, mechanical design, there's software, there's managing a team. All of these things have to work together and everybody else is trying to do the same thing and trying to do it at the same level or a higher level. People have more experience, less experience. Everyone's coming into this uh, with a different uh, background, uh, which makes this really uh, difficult. Um, and because of how t short your matches are, you get 10 matches in an entire uh, qual session, if you lose one of those matches or two of those matches, it drastically changes your standings. Uh, so there's a lot of an opportunity where a tiny little uh, thing that goes wrong can have a significant impact on the outcome of a match, of, a, uh, an, of an event. 
So we're trying to look at how we can overcome that, how we can limit the opportunities where things can go wrong. Uh, so we have a four-part solution to beating uh, Murphy, and I'll uh, stand over here so I can fit in the way. Uh, and we'll go over these each in order. Number one, plan to succeed. So what that means, uh, set goals, set realistic goals, and make sure you are like a hawk running your season to meet those goals. Especially during build season, don't be, don't be distracted from your goals. Number two, plan for failure because your success plans will, will fail. So make sure you have backup plans. <laughs> uh, three, minimize risk. This is actually a whole field of study. I, I work in the nuclear industry, and, and um, we, we spend a lot of time working on that. Um, so I'm going to relay some of the techniques that we use in my industry, and airlines and medical and all those things. Um, and we've been applying to the team. And then before, always get better, improve. Um, so you're going to have mistakes, you're going to have events, you're going to have um, failures, and uh, at each opportunity, each of those is an opportunity to learn and prevent for the next time. So make sure you're constantly improving. And that's our four-part solution. All right. Uh, so our first part is plan to succeed. Uh, so our, our presentation really isn't about setting goals for the season, but it's the first start, uh, the first step of what we do. So last year, for instance, um, we wanted to say that we could try and win certain matches. And to do that, we wanted it to not depend on who we were partnered with. Uh, and that means that we needed to, we, had to, we started off by trying to guess how many uh, points would be scored in a match. So what's an average match look like? How many points would be scored? Uh, it's a guess at the very start when we we're trying to design this before any matches have been played. Uh, so we looked at things like how long it took RI3D teams to cycle, um, how long did it take them to put, to put a hatch on or put a, a score a cargo, and we used that to guess maybe a good team would be able to do so many cycles in a match. And we guessed uh, roughly how many points do you think you're going to see uh, in various levels of, of play. So maybe a really good team might be able to score 20 points, or an Ontario team might be able to score 30 points, or an really top-end team may be able to score 50 points, and we decided where we wanted to sit in that level. Um, and we said, what would it take then to do that? What does our robot have to do in order to achieve that scoring? Um, and if we said maybe a, an average match is 150 points, we want it to be somewhere of just about half of that so that we could have some control over the outcome of that match, even if one of our robots might not have worked on an alliance. Uh, it's also important to think about what uh, that game actually entails. Uh, we went into Steamworks and we decided to play a fuel game. Um, Steamworks wasn't a fuel game. Um, so it, it <coughs> ended up knowing what the game's about and how you're going to score points is very important to designing a good robot. Um, prototyping, uh, again, other teams, other presentations in this conference will talk about this better. Uh, but we actually encourage prototyping um, partially because uh, we like to have all the answers before we really start building the robot. Um, teams with more experience already have all the answers. I know, um, I, I know 2056, for instance, uh, does very little prototyping and starts building very, very early compared to us. We usually don't start the final robot until we re really, and then it's a real rush. Um, but in the time before that, uh, we, we do a lot of prototyping, maybe all of, uh, all of week one for sure, um, and usually part of week two. Uh, and the reason is we, we really want to we want to know we're on the right track. We want to find the right answers. Um, I, I'm kind of uh, <coughs> detail oriented that way. I guess I, I like to see the whole. I teach my students about the solution space. So you have space in front of you that has all of the solutions. Pardon me, all the solutions for everything. Um, it has hills and there's valleys. You know, peaks where where there's high performance and, and crevices where it's a dead end. Um, I want to know the whole layout of the land uh, before we choose our path through the solution space. Um, so uh, you can't, obviously, check everything, but you can look at old games, you can do research. It doesn't have to be actually prototyping. What you want to concentrate in prototyping is the things that are new, the things that no one's looked at, so the game piece, usually. Um, yeah? Real quick question, what does COTS mean? Here? Oh, COTS means commercial off the shelf. Okay. Um, 
it's actually a, a defined term in the manual as well because it doesn't count for your weight allowance. Even though that might, that's going to change this year too. Uh, oh, it doesn't count. Yeah, it, for your withholding allowance. Yeah. Um, if you bring in parts like so yeah. in competition, like spare parts, if they're caught, so if I can go to a place and buy them, it don't count to your withholding allowance. But if you added a gearbox or assembled something, then it counts for your withholding. In previous years, I don't know how that's going to play out. Just to go back on your point, Chris, is um. When you're developing your your role play, your game strategy, like when you're analyzing how many points you guys are going to score, yeah, um, if that comes into your design of your robot, do you like to control your own destiny? Do you try to say we're going to score everything, or are we designing a robot that only scores the disc or the ball, or you have to do both? Like we tried that last year and yeah. it backfired for yeah, our yeah, team. Yeah. So, so I think that depends. So last year, so. The last couple of years, we have we, we, we set a goal. So what's our goal for the season? Where do we want to end up in the season? Um, our goal last year was to make it to Einstein. That was that was the goal that our team set at the start of the year. So the, the question was, how do you do that? Um, and to accomplish that, it was, okay, you have to, so we said we wanted to do certain things. We wanted to win one event locally. We wanted to make it to finals to a couple of events. Um, and then we had to, to make it to Einstein, we had to win our division at Worlds. Uh, so what would it take to be a robot that did that and control your destiny? Uh, so we said that it would actually be a really good robot that would just be a fast cycler on level one. That would probably outscore us um, in terms of points. But then we would have to depend on someone else to score the level two and three. Uh, so we... To get the ranking point. To get the ranking point, right? Because, because <coughs> the game was determined, or the, the uh, rankings were determined by ranking points and not just overall score, uh, we said that we have to be able to control the level two and three, um, as well as climb. We don't always build a robot that can do everything, um, but last year, because of the goal that we set, and we wanted to be able to control the outcome, we did build a robot that can do everything. Uh, we would recommend build a robot that suits your goal. So um, if you aren't setting a goal to be an Alliance captain and set your destiny on, on a particular event, you want to be like a first pick, a fast cycler would have been a better goal than to build a, a level three uh, rocket robot, um, which might have gotten a lot fewer cycles. Um, it would have ended up higher on our pick list, for instance. A robot that could do level three really slowly versus a level one cycler that could really put a lot of cycles in would have ended up much higher on a pick list like ours because um, we could have put those level three things in, right? So it depends where you're, what you're aiming for as your season goal. Um, we, so being able to do everything uh, is a recent uh, <coughs> achievement of our team. Um, we, we certainly couldn't in our first two years and our third year we sort of failed at doing everything. Um, so it's only in the last two years that we've built the capacity to be able to do everything um, and it's still a, a, a great <coughs> struggle. Um, I think it'll be easier uh, in 2020 with only, the, you only have to build one robot now. Um, to be competitive, so um, if to be able to, to build a world class robot like that, um, it's not just something you do in the season. It's something that you build um, in terms of training, in terms of your workshop, in terms of your tools, in terms of material you have. It takes money, it takes time, but um, but if you've got that sort of multi year plan to put those pieces into place, mm -hmm. you'll be in a better shot for it. Um, I would suggest design as early as you can and test as often as you can. Um, so we we changed, like a lot of the things that go into robots that are ours that you might have seen in competition were added after bag day. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, it's just, like Steamworks for instance was not a fuel game. Our, our robot on bag day for Steamworks couldn't pick up a gear. <laughs> um, so uh, we, that was an, that, we thought it'd be a really easy thing. We, we would add it on later on. It's an oversight, um, but uh, it, it changes a lot. Test as early as you can. Build something and test. Find a practice field. We, we are stewards of the Robodrome, and you are welcome to, to drop by anytime and, and practice on our field uh, and, and play with some other robots. Uh, so that's an, an open invitation. I know there are other practice fields around uh, if you're not from the area, but try to get onto a practice field. Try to actually manipulate a game piece as early as you can and see how does your robot uh, behave with that. 
we'll, we'll talk about it in a coming slide too, but um, it's okay to have ambitious goals, but make sure you have the backup plans, the fallbacks as well, um, ready to go. Uh, so before I leave the prototyping slide then, I just wanna say, prototyping is hard, it's costly, uh, but there are some ways you can work uh, with just cheap things, like this was our prototype from 2018, where we learned that we needed a, a dual pressure intake thing that was a real competitive advantage for us. We needed to have a hard grip and a soft grip, soft grip for intake and hard grip for holding. And, and that came with like this, this uh, surgical tube and wooden assembly thing cut out with jigsaws. Uh, now we actually have a laser cutter, which is super great because it's very easy, it's fast and it's very easy to teach students. You can't crash it uh, easily. Uh, <laughs> and so we expect you to be using the, the laser cutter uh, a lot this year, but, um, but you don't have to have that. Uh, the Spectrum, uh, which is team 38 something something, uh, has a has a prototype system on Chief Del Five. So there's 3D printed parts. You can be printing them right now. Uh, they they fit with three quarter inch PVC pipe, which is dirt cheap. So you can you can go grab a bunch of three quarter inch PVC pipe and print these things and make yourself kind of a frame for building these kind of things if you don't have the aluminum to spare, right? Um, so that's a, a really good advantage. There, there are options to do it and. You know, only, as I said, only work on the things that you're unsure of because you don't have a lot of time. Uh, but one last thing before I go, uh, this is a great way to use up students. Um, that especially, we find after you've done the strategy discussions in week one, um, there's a lull where our design student, not every kid wants to do design, so our design team needs at least a week sometimes to, to work out the details and then the rest of your team is, we wanna go, we wanna go, what do we do, and, and nothing to do. So building the field, as, as Stan talked about, is a great one, and also prototyping. Um, so I'm taking too long on this one. Uh, just to actually add two things to the previous slide. Uh, one thing, I know, just <laughs> add the red and switches. Uh, one thing is, although mentors <coughs> and veteran students might know the answer to a solution, if your rookies don't ever get a chance to try things and experiment, they'll never find out why their idea didn't work. So I think right. prototyping is really important for that as well. Uh, give, you a, give students a chance to verify that things work or don't. Um, and to kind of go back to the, one of the previous questions, we usually try to set a budget in terms of difficulty. So um, one of the things we do at the start is we say, uh, to make a robot drive might be a difficulty of one, to make a robot um, do a fully autonomous placement of this thing might be a level five. Uh, you have 25 or 30 difficulty points, design some robots. What are your robots gonna do? Um, and then we try to stay within that budget. So if you say, I want to do all the hard things, well, you've gone over budget. We can't build that robot. Um, we don't have that amount of capacity to build a robot to do that. Um, we've already chatted a little about iteration. Um, the, the 2017 gear mechanism, uh, we thought it would be a really easy thing. How hard is it to pick up a gear and put it on a peg? It shouldn't be really hard. So we spent all of our effort building a shooter. And uh, it turns out that Shooters were not really that useful in 2017. Um, and it was all about the gear. Sorry? It makes a great demo bot. It was an probably. awesome demo bot. We still use that robot as our demo bot, but the game that year was about the gears. Um, so this was an after bag day thing. We didn't, we didn't end up spending enough time actually like running the, the points and figuring out how much you got for the gears and the, the fuel, and it didn't, didn't quite click in our, in our design at that point. The ramp, 2018, to get ranking points, um, the, the double lift was really important, but we added the ramp after bag day. So don't, don't be afraid to continually improve. Don't just say your design has to be set in stone at a particular point in time. Uh, you can add more things on, but ensure that you have a functioning robot uh, as early as you can. If you add something on and you design that in, it helps to design it in so there's a place for it to go, but uh, don't be afraid to either lose an idea or to add something on later on. Uh, we wanted this year, at the beginning, uh, we wanted to have a floor pickup. Um, and uh, we, uh, for hatches, and we eventually, we, we left space in the robot for that, and eventually we decided it wasn't worthwhile. So we completely removed that. Um, and our hatch mech, uh, in various forms this year, um, from 3D printed to laser cut to routered, um, we probably went through about 20 different versions of this hatch mech. Some were longer, shorter, had completely different looks to it, and then there were a lot of very, very small incremental designs maybe adding an extra inch of stroke, maybe changing the location of something. But initially, they were vastly <coughs> different things that we tried. Uh, so just don't be afraid to try an idea. Uh, try something, put it on the robot, especially if you have any uh, 
manufacturing capabilities that can make something quickly, uh, we would laser cut things. Uh, so it was not uncommon that in a single night we would go through two or three different little revisions uh, saying we need to add something or we were going to change where our stop was and we would put it on and our drive team would practice with it. And they would tell us, is this making a difference? Can they pick up this hatch from uh, a greater angle? Can they uh, put it on more reliably? Uh, so that was a very uh, significant thing, but there is a trade-off. If you don't have a functioning robot, your drive team can't practice with it. Uh, so ensure you have something they can practice with. If they can't practice with it, making an amazing robot that they've had no chance to actually test out isn't as good as giving them a little bit of time to work with it and practice with it. And we've seen that at events. We've taken our robot and we've given it to a brand new drive team of ours and they don't score anywhere near as good as um, our drive team or as good as other teams which have a robot which might not be able to do certain things that ours can, but they're more practiced with it. Practice makes a huge amount of difference. Yep. So um, that was the first aspect. And there's lots, lots more to talk about. The strategy sessions here, we'll talk a lot about it as well. Um, I think our, our real insight here comes in the next few um, parts. And the first of those is prepare for failure. Um, so there's a couple of different aspects. The first one here is if you are prepared for a failure, if you, and I'll talk about what those preparations might look like, then when that failure happens, its consequence is minimized, right? The, the, the amount of damage it can do is a small, small, because everyone will suffer failure in the, in the course of a competition or a season. Um, if you're ready for it, uh, then, then it'll be over fast and not do too much damage. So Stan talked a little bit about this, uh, bringing spares to competition. Um, in 2017, uh, our climber broke every five matches or so. Yeah. Um, and so we, we knew that from practice, um, and uh, we didn't really have time to improve the design. So uh, we just brought spares, and we were constantly rebuilding the spare and, and just you know being ready to swap it in when it did break. We lost, we mostly did okay. We lost a couple of climbs, um, and that was when, when we did, that was a lack of preparation. But when it did, you know, we were ready to swap one in. I'll talk a little bit over the next couple of examples, too, about designing for maintainability. This is huge, and it's really hard to do when you're just trying to get a robot built. Uh, it gets better with, with experience and practice. Um, but make design choices that make it easy to work on the robot, because you're going to have to work on the robot. It's not just going to be a product that you make, and it's perfect. Um, lots of, you know, you'll be making improvements in the, in the season. You'll be fixing things. So uh, some examples, we, we chose in 2017 to move from the Kitbot chassis to uh, the West Coast driver, the, or the um, uh, Versa chassis, which is the VEX product. Um, now, the kit chassis is great. I, I don't want to um, discourage that because it's, it's fast and cheap and easy and strong. It's great. Uh, but the reason we chose is because uh, we did a, a little test for how long it took to replace a wheels. And we found that we were replacing wheels during competition. Um, omni wheels break and shredded wheels rip and, and the rubber wheels wear down. Um, and that was like a 20 minute process with the kit apart chassis, especially the center wheel, which is ridiculous. Um, whereas with the uh, <coughs> Versa chassis, it's five seconds, like literally just under the bolt and the wheel comes right off. So that was a, a big compelling advantage of design for maintainability advantage. Um, Things like keeping your wiring neat and clean, we do not do as good a job as we could. Um, I, I recommend you Google the holy cows. I don't remember what their team name is, but <coughs> if you Google holy cows wiring, oh, it's beautiful. I, I don't know how it stays that way in the season during maintenance. That's, the, that's when we find the wiring gets bad. As soon as you have to change something, then we start taking shortcuts. But wiring well, labeling things, that it's not just for prettiness, it also makes maintaining easier. And, and this is neat too, um, train under adversity. Don't just train for your perfect cycle. Um, practice, and you're gonna get this practice if you practice enough, um, practice uh, replacing parts that break, right, before competition. Practice driving when things are broken. We, we'll often in our, we'll talk about practice in a moment, but in our um, uh, practice sessions, we'll let, we'll tell our drivers that, okay, your hatch mechanism is broken, you can't do that, now play another hatch. What scores do we get? Keeping that data, and making sure they know, you know, or you know, the intake doesn't work. All right, now what do you do? Um, because 
you're, you're getting, you're preparing for that failure so that nothing's ever a surprise. Um, I will extend the uh, design for maintainability beyond just uh, mechanical to software as well. Uh, we don't do nearly as good a job as we should uh, on that aspect, but uh, it's very easy to just cobble together code because someone needs to practice with it now, um, but then it makes it much harder to maintain later on. Uh, so, stay in mind. Um, you need a backup plan. Things aren't always going to work out. Uh, things, as a matter of fact, rarely will work out as you would like them to. Um, and you should be able to come up with some idea of how long these things are going to take. So uh, if we we're doing an unbagged period, for instance, uh, we will have allocated out, we're gonna set out the tools that we're gonna need, we're gonna say how long it's gonna take to swap this out, how much time do we have in total, um, how are we gonna break down that time? So someone's gonna be working on switching out this one part, we're gonna have tools ready. In the meantime, these people are gonna be working on this other thing, uh, so everything is, is timed out fairly well when you have very limited amounts of time. Um, so, uh, sometimes you just run out of time in your season. You don't have enough time in your six weeks before bag day to get everything done. So sometimes you're gonna make that decision to say, this item will be added on afterwards. Uh, that's less of a problem this year. Uh, we don't have a bag day, so hopefully it gives us a little more of a chance. I think the issue though is that a lot of teams are going to keep things for later on, and because they don't have that deadline until their first competition, it's going to become more problematic and you're gonna run out of time. So I suggest you still keep that deadline, try to get your robot fully working in six weeks, um, and then you can add uh, things on after that. So this year, um, we removed the floor pickup, we wanted it, we, we thought it would be a great thing, we thought it would be, uh, be really helpful. Um, it turns out it wasn't as helpful later on in the season as we thought it might be, and we didn't have any space in the robot uh, to, to make it work in. Um, double flying, Again, a thing that we really wanted, uh, but we couldn't add it on to the robot and the space and weight and everything else uh, that we would have liked to. Uh, we added our ramp after bag day um, and in 2018, and it changed this design between competitions. We had one originally which was made out of uh, it was, uh, welded aluminum, uh, then we had a CNC cut version a little later on, so it changes, it, it uh, evolves over time. Um, the climber in 2016 got added on later on, hand grabber in 2015. Uh, so adding things, not a big deal. Uh, just plan for it and ensure that you have time allocated for the things you want and that you get a robot that's working as soon as you can. Yeah, I'm, just what Chris said, I'm, I'm a big fan of really, really strong management of schedule. I, I know a lot of teams I think suffer this way, but they'll have great design experience, fantastic mentors, even really, really trained uh, students, better trained students than we do. Um, but they'll get themselves in a trap where, you know, they're confident in their abilities and they'll work on this thing and they'll work on this thing right up until the first day of competition and it never runs, right? So <coughs> that's, that's really what I spend most of my time doing during build season is I'm a pain um, to everyone because I, I have this whole list of off ramps in my, in my head. So we've got this big plan and the very first thing that needs to be done is this. This is, a, this is a absolutely mass, must done. The drive base needs to be built, so the gearboxes and the rail, all that we have to start on that right away. And then our next priority is the intake. And then, you know, things that are really ambitious, like the double climb or the floor pickup, uh, or even the lift, the single climb, those are down the priority list, and I have, I have cut dates for those. So if they're not designed by a certain date, we're not gonna, we're, Cutting it, leaving a gap in the robot, we'll come back to them maybe. If they're not built by a certain date, then they come off, even if they're half built. Um, and and people hate me when I call those dates. Um, usually, I'll give like a one-day warning or something like that. It's like, okay, you got today, you got this Saturday to get that working. It's not it's coming off the robot. We almost pulled the shooter mm. off after, uh, in yeah. 2017, uh, but we managed to maybe get it to score a few more points. Um, so that just have those off ramps ready uh, that's really a, a good technique to to limit um, the, the consequence of, of missing your goals so just the, the 2017 thing uh, we built a, a robot that could shoot um, the, the the goal of that wasn't actually to score points with it it was to get the ranking points uh, so again we were trying to control our destiny in 2017 we wanted the ranking points for getting the 40 kpa you had to get <coughs> 40 fuel balls in an auto um, we never quite managed to get 40 fuel balls in, we could get about 30 in. Um, we figured if we could get 30 in, and then our drive team could score the, the remaining balls in Teleop, you could get that ranking point. 
Uh, so that was our cutoff. Our cutoff was you have to be able to get the 30 points in auto before the competition. Otherwise, what's the point of the shooter? You can't get all of those points in tele off, so you might as well just remove the shooter entirely. Uh, we have had a number of scenarios where we've had to change something in a hurry. Uh, like, we've got between matches, something fundamental fails. Um, and you have to plan for that. Uh, so a couple of years ago, uh, district champs, we had talons that failed. We had, this has been a, a bane of our existence for a little while. Um, talons, we had a talon, a drive talon uh, fail on us and it was switched out in two minutes. Uh, so that was good. But the advantage was on this robot, we had everything mounted at the bottom. So underneath, um, all of our uh, electronics are mounted. There's a clear Lexan cover. You pop the four bolts on that, and then everything is exposed. This is uh, so <laughs> that, that was really helpful. Uh, the next year, we decided we'd mount everything underneath, uh, on the top side, underneath our elevator, impossible to get to anything. Um, the problem with this robot was we had some solenoids that were completely inaccessible. They were buried and a little bit hard to get to. Right in yeah. here. They're on the top. They're not at the bottom on this particular one. No. Uh, we couldn't get to them. They're under the topper, so it would be like a half an hour fix to remove to replace those. And of course, one of those stopped working. Uh, so we've moved to these DIN rail mounts. Uh, so we put a DIN rail onto our robot. Uh, we try to keep the area around it accessible. These are 3D printed, um, and each of our components screws into it. So it's fastened in that way. It's not zip tied in. It's not screwed in. Uh, so it's really easy, screwdriver in, pop the component out, unplug the wire, and it's a really, really quick change from there. Uh, and it's important that those are accessible. They've got to actually be in a place where you can get a screwdriver in and get to and not covered by a big garbage can acting as your hopper. Exactly. Uh, so bottom side is really good. Uh, really quick, another example, um, and this is in the build, thing, right? Um, I think Stan talked about this as well. In, uh, in 2015, our first year, uh, we have a, a driver station with a laptop given to us by a sponsor, and it crashed all the time. Uh, and so we, we, we lost some matches because the robot just didn't reboot in time. Um, the, in 2016, uh, we, yeah, in Pittsburgh, our networker, we actually had to pull us, um, in, in finals, I think we had to pull uh, a field laptop or a laptop from the venue. Uh, in order another, to team another team donated. donated. It was, we went to the field, Network card was completely dead, plugged in, nothing. Couldn't connect, um, didn't even detect the network card on our, on our driver's station. It was one of the, it was a netbook you get in your rookie year. Yeah. Um, and, and then a bunch of teams came and helped us out. But. And, and at Ruckus, um, this is a fun story too, we, we, we go down on a bus to Ruckus. It's our first event, it's in, next, in the it's, next month. Yeah, um, and we all do it, we do it one day, so the kids get on the bus like 4 a.m. and they don't get back till midnight. Um, but that because we have one driver, the very first thing he does when he arrives at Rochester is he goes to a hotel to sleep. And we left our one driver station laptop on that bus. We didn't actually know what hotel he was going to. It was gone. And, none, and we all came on the bus, so none of us had a means to go chase him, right? Luckily, we had one parent who had driven down, and so we called her up. We were like, go find that bus, get that bus. And we almost missed our first match. Uh, so yeah. now, yeah, but now we bring two driver stations. Always, all made up, and we check that they come off the bus. Little things on that, like I have a laptop at all times with me, that's not good enough. Having a laptop isn't a driver station. You actually need the controllers that you're using. Um, so you need the controllers to go along with it. A lot of us had laptops at this event that we could have used to run the, the computers, the driver station software. We didn't have the controllers. They were up in a shelf on the top of a bus 30 minutes away. Okay. So, sorry, uh, I'm going to take this one. Sure, go for it. Uh, so, this, the third aspect to our, our um, antidote to Murphy's Law is minimizing risk. And this is something that I've, I've done a fair amount of training on. Uh, and the slides here are pretty dense, so feel free to stop me uh, as we go on. But there are, there are industry techniques for reducing the incidence of, of errors and reducing their consequence. Ideally, you want to get failures, and I'll show you how that's defined, to zero. You do that uh, with something called the Swiss cheese model. I'll talk about that uh, in a second. But basically, well, I'll talk about it right now. Okay, so events. Events are, 
they don't, they don't want to call them accidents or errors. Or, um, they, they're just things that happen, right? Uh, and, and the real um, insight uh, is that, and I'll talk about that in the next slide, humans are fallible, right? Like, you can't train your way to perfection. You just can't. <coughs> um, if your goal is, if your system needs to run with perfect humans, it's going to fail, right? Because they don't exist. Uh, so you need to put in barriers in order to stop those events, so barriers for turning into failures. And they need several of them because they'll each only stop a fraction. So uh, some of the barriers you can put. First, you can start to try and eliminate the risk. Eli eliminate the things that might cause events um, by changing the design, changing your strategy. Uh, so uh, examples we put in here, overbuild your mechanisms. I, I get a lot of pushback on this because I like to design the robots. I like the robots to be designed like nuclear power equipment. And uh, the, the real competitive students and mentors, they you know, want to build like F1 cars where they're just on the margin of breaking, right? And that drives me crazy. So it's a bit of a back and forth. But if you can overbuild mechanisms, then the chance of them failing are less. And if that means you can only you can have fewer mechanisms because they weigh more, they cost more, uh, that's a trade-off I'm willing to make. Um, you can also add redundancy to components. That's a, that's a really great thing. So uh, most of our intakes recently have two motors on them, two motors, two gearboxes. So then if one, any one motor fails, uh, the other one, you wouldn't even notice really. Maybe it picks up a ball a little less effectively, but still runs. That actually happened to us on Einstein finals this year. One of the motors in our intake was dead. Uh, and we still, man, it, it, it had a performance impact, but it was enough that you could still like pick up a ball and still function. Um, it doesn't work for everything. Um, so uh, controllers, we still haven't figured out a way to have two controllers be independent of each other. Usually in programming, one has to follow the other. So if the leader dies, they're both dead. If the follower dies, you're still okay. But we're trying <coughs> So that's a, a lot of the, like the sparks and the talent, you have a, a master slave, a leader and a follower. Um, if you set them all up as leaders and followers, it's great because it's really easy to program. You just tell the leader, go do this, and the follower does exactly the same thing. Uh, but if the one motor that you're actually telling to do something dies, all of the other ones don't behave. Uh, it won't just trickle down from them because that, that leader needs to still convey that message elsewhere, uh, which is kind of unfortunate. Um, so we've had an issue with that. It shouldn't be designed like that. It should be that they all yeah, listen to the same signal, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, as opposed to one dying making an, uh, having an impact, but we haven't found that to be true. If the leader dies, everything's dead. So we're still working on that. But, but redundancy, whatever you can do for redundancy will help. Again, cost and weight impact, notwithstanding. Um, so add physical barriers. So this is, these are in order, by the way. The most effective things is to eliminate the risk. Next most effective thing is to add barriers, physical barriers, like things that will actually, no matter what anyone does, will stop bad event happening. So if you've got a software limit on an elevator travel, for instance, um, we didn't have this this year, by the way, uh, after that, you want to have a hard stop. You want to have something that where the robot, where, you know, even if the motor stalled, wasn't, it, the robot can't break itself, right? It's going to hit that hard stop. Uh, guards are another example. I'll show an example later where some, you have to be careful with these barriers. Sometimes they actually make the risk more <coughs> than they eliminate. But you put guards on things, um, and that way, you know, if a robot uh, comes into, you, if another robot comes into your frame perimeter, it's not going to kill your robot, right? So physical barriers, that's kind of the first leaky hole wall you can use to stop the effect of some risks. Procedural barriers, we'll talk about some of these in example. Um, training, checklists, things that people do, and we spend a lot of time on these procedural barriers. Um, in order to catch mistakes, um, recognize them, and correct them before they do damage. But because that requires human performance, uh, procedural barriers are less effective than, than physical barriers. And so that, that comes in with D with the warning signals. Um, you, need to, you need to learn what the robot sounds like. I find sound the biggest thing actually in the pit. You know, when you're doing your system check, you have to listen to what it sounds like and if it doesn't sound like it used to sound, something's wrong, right? Um, learn the things that break, right? When you're, you're doing practice sessions in your practice field or, or in a visiting practice field, and 
the wrist <coughs> gearbox broke, well, then that's something you look at for the rest of the season. Like, always be checking that. And do all of that. All of that. Defense in depth is a term that's a lot used in my industry. Um, you put all those things in place, and you can turn your number of failures, which are the number of events that get all the way through to an accident, down to zero. Uh, these, by the way, last thing to say about that, are exactly the same process you use for safety. So nuclear safety is something that I, that I spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, we put in all of these, these sort of ideas, they're kind of broad scale ideas when you have to think about how to turn them into practices, but you can do the same in your shop. So guarding, training, um, uh, keeping an eye out, uh, having a questioning attitude, all of these things are, are ways that you can um, keep people safe in your shop and their competition. All right, uh, so to add on to a little bit of what uh, Brendan said over here, um, we have, we, we recognize that we're not going to get a perfect performance from a person, which means we're gonna try to put things in place to try and not require perfect performance. Uh, so somehow we have to have enough little things in the way that something which would have normally failed is not going to fail at the end because something prevents that failure. So one of the things that we had is we had, you could have a climb that was completely manual at the uh, end of the day, at the end of uh, the, uh, the previous year, the deep space games. And so we've, we've had, okay, instead of having a manual climb where you have to time everything, <coughs> have a key combo, but that key combo has to have a safety. Uh, it can't be just press one button to have your entire robot climb in the middle of a match. Someone's gonna hit that button by accident. Uh, so it's gotta be something where it's very difficult to hit these two keys at the same time. So all of our um, overrides or all of our things will always have two awkward keys that you have to hold one and then the other one is in some place where it's not easy to hit by accident. Like it's never, select and yeah, it's it. never two keys that are right beside each other. Uh, so it's always two things which would preferably be two, off, two, two different hands <coughs> um, and there's always an override for all of these. So the climbing is a two key combo for us uh, and not just one button to climb. Um, we left a little bit of human uh, decision in there, um, as opposed to making it a fully automatic climb, uh, so that there were some options for them to, um, if the power wasn't quite where they wanted it to be, if the wheels had slipped a little bit, they could still, uh, they had, they, they pretty much had to hold two buttons, and then they could release one, and then release the second one. Um, and it would, it would follow through with a predefined procedure. Uh, things like aligning, having a human align the robot, um, is difficult. You can't do it as quickly. At our first competition, we let the humans align. Um, at the second competition, we had a camera do the alignment. Uh, the humans retained the option, do they want to do it or not, uh, but uh, the option was there and it greatly improved performance. Um, anything which uh, do they have an option for, for doing, if you can automate it, it's really good. So going to predefined levels on an elevator. Um, one button to go to a particular level. Uh, if it's a level you're using all the time, um, if it's a level one or a level two, and they're always going to go to the same height, that should be predefined and it should just happen. They shouldn't have to manually try to get up to a particular level because they're never going to be able to do it effectively and repeatably in the same amount of time. Um, and of course, you're going to have things that don't work. Uh, you have to figure out why did they not work. If you just said, okay, this thing broke and that, that's it, uh, you're just going to end up replacing it and replacing it and replacing it. You have to determine what caused this and try to get to the root of that problem. Um, analyze your failures and figure out what didn't work, how can we make it better, um, why did it break? Was it something that the humans did? Was it something that was preventable? Can we put something in place to prevent that from happening again in the future? These, these two techniques, without spending too much time on them, are worth looking up. Uh, failure modes and effects analysis, FMEA, is a, is a term. Um, I don't think too many robot teams actually do this. But that's what you do before an event. So you look at your robot design, maybe before even you build it. Can you repeat that, sorry? Sorry, failure modes and effects analysis, FMEA, is where you look at every single component or every system, you can do it whatever grain you want, and you rank the chances it will fail, uh, the, the potential that you'll notice the failure, and the consequence of the failure on a five-point scale each of those things, and then you add them all up. 
And what it does is it gives you a score for each of these failure modes, and the ones with the highest scores are the things you should probably look at to fix. So you guys are mentors, and you have a design team, and they're designing something, and you're looking at it, and like with your experience, you know it's gonna fail. You still let them design that and build a prototype for it? If it's a prototype and we're just experimenting early in the year, I think we're definitely gonna let them build it. Like prototyping in week one, with anything that's reasonable, we normally have a, a mentor leading a little prototype session, and they're gonna experiment. They're gonna play with different ideas. Um, do we want uh, grippers on the side? Do we want grippers on the top? Um, are we gonna try and pick up a suction. cube with Velcro or suction? They'll take a vacuum and try to do it. Um, good, bad, doesn't matter. Uh, one of the things that we find is that in brainstorming, you often like you, you want to promote uh, all ideas. People think that a bad idea is not useful. It's not so useful to build a robot, but it's useful to spur on new ideas. If you if someone if a kid says, "Let's make a robot that flies," great, I can't do that, but you can maybe get a good idea out of that. Someone will take a, a tangent off of that. Let's make a robot that can fly, and say maybe we are going to do thing A or thing B, and then it's spurring those new ideas. So that experimentation. Even if you know it's not going to work, I think is really important to encourage early in the season. And what about when, when it comes to the, building? What about if you're in like the middle of a competition, you go into playoffs, and something breaks? Is there like a just lead mentor has the final say? Because sometimes like we've got university kids coming back that are mentoring. Everyone's trying to put their hands in to fix a problem. Like, how do you guys? Is there this? How's that control? Yeah, we we do have a hierarchy. Yeah. Um, so during the design stage, I'm, I'm lead engineer, but I do my best and every year I get better at um, not doing the details of the decision. So I, I wait for the team to propose to me, right? And if there's a con, don't come to consensus, then it's my job to pick, right? Um, if they choose something that I'm not comfortable with, it's their job to convince me, okay? So, <coughs> so the final robot design, usually it happens the end of week, the middle of week three, beginning yeah. of week three, something like that is I gotta sign off on that, right? So this is the robot we're building. And, and I, we've had conflict over that, right? Um, but that's just, that's just the way we set up our team. I know other teams set up things differently. Not necessarily I'm doing the design, but I'm definitely saying what design we're doing. But in the competition, we also have a pit captain. And they're the ones saying, okay, we have five minutes, this is sort of half working, we're not gonna repair it. Um, or we are gonna repair it. And, and they wear it, you know, if, um, and that actually was a, uh, that has been students in the past. We had our drive coach was a student last year. Um, the, each person has their sort of scope of decision-making responsibilities uh, that, that um, we as a lead mentor is a point, right? So this person is in charge. And they, they actually have a work schedule that says on the top who's in charge of what. Um, so it's really, I mean, I used to be in cadets, so I'm kind of, I like hierarchies. Uh, <laughs> and um, we find that works really well. Other teams work well with consensus, which is great, uh, but the competition is a fast moving <coughs> thing, so you, it helps to have someone who can make that call and, and know that you know, the teams behind them, even if they, it's the wrong call, <coughs> you know, um, we, don't, we don't excoriate the people who, who make the wrong decision. Um, we learn from them, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Neither of us were in the pit, actually, uh, this entire season. Uh, no, so, that's weird. Yeah. Um, so both of us were either like in someone else's pit or on a practice field or in the stands. We had one of our uh, university mentors ran our pit um, and then we had uh, a bunch of students. So there was one mentor in there um, helping them out if they ran into trouble, but our students pretty much knew what they were going to do. They had a list of things to check for and it was the odd scenario where our university mentor would have to provide some guidance and help them out when they ran into a little bit of trouble. It depends on where we are in, in that off-road, off-ramp mm -hmm. schedule. So if we're in the beginning and a design team is gonna need another two weeks to finish anyway, uh, and there's an idea that maybe there's a rough chance of, I mean, you know, suction climbs this year, I would have, if it was just me saying, we're gonna do this or not do this, I would have cut, because you can suction never works in FRC, except it does, uh, right? So um, it's good, 
it's good to let some ideas flourish. Um, especially <coughs> ownership on the team. You know, students need to feel like um, they have the space to be creative and explore and, and see the consequence, even if it's not doesn't look to an experienced student or engineer or, or mentor that that is going to work. But you do have to be very very mindful of the schedule. Um, so this is a night we we have had <coughs> students say a week before competition. Hey, um, I saw this team do this suction climb. Can we add that? You know, for before uh, Ryerson? No, no, we can't. You know, <laughs> so, sorry. You can go practice that. You can go prototype that, right? Um, and maybe if it tests well, we'll get it on the second competition. But at this point, we pass that offer. Um, five whys. Won't spend much too much time on, time on that. But that's another really good technique. If FMEA is something you do before. You discover a failure, five whys is a performance technique you do after you discover a failure. It's like the five-year-old who a keeps asking you why. So let's give an example. Um, who had something fail on the robot this year at competition? Okay, what, did, what failed? Um, we had um, the metal of our elevator. The metal of your elevator failed. Yeah. Why, did it, why did the metal of your elevator fail? The belt got um, stuck. Couldn't fail. The belts got stuck and it got pulled and it pulled down on the elevator. Okay, why did the belts get stuck uh, and it pulled down on the elevator? Um, I think we, I think we I put the belt on wrong. Yeah, we put the belt, put on, the belt on wrong. Yeah. Okay, why did you put the belt on wrong? Uh, probably because we didn't test it enough. Yeah. Probably because we didn't test it enough. And why didn't you test it enough? Because we wanted to make it super robot. <laughs> and it didn't yeah. work. And why did you want to make it super robot? Because we wanted it. Yeah. So, so. <laughs> According to five whys, and this is only a technique, right? You don't have to do this religiously. Yeah. The fifth why, um, this is from Six Sigma, by the way. Uh, the fifth why is the root cause. Mm -hmm. The root cause of your failure of the robot breaking is because you took, you took on too much, mm -hmm. right? Um, but all of those whys along the way are also really useful, mm -hmm. right? The belt's not um, putting on right. You know, you can, you can address that root cause, or that cause. So there's a root cause, but there's all these causes along the way. So doing that why uh, <coughs> exercise is, is really useful. So just to touch on the failure mode thing one more time, um, we had a ramp in 2018. Um, if our ramp didn't deploy, uh, there were two ways of setting up your, your, your ramp deploy. We could have had a, a mechanism which uh, actively pushed out. So we had a little piston that went into a hole. Uh, we could have had a mechanism which actively pushed that piston out and when you deployed, it would retract it. Um, or we could have had a mechanism which the default was that the piston was out, and we had to retract it. Uh, they're very subtly different, um, but the failure modes are different. Um, the default in one is that the piston is retracted and the ramp will fall on its own. Um, so if our pneumatic system failed in the middle of a match, in that scenario, the ramp would deploy. In the other scenario, if our pneumatic system failed, the ramp would not deploy at the end, but throughout the rest of the match, everything would be fine. Um, so the cost of those two design decisions are very different. In one scenario, you don't deploy the ramp at the end, you don't get your double climb, but the rest of the match still works. In the other design decision, um, you deploy the ramp early, it costs you the match, and you still probably don't get your climb at the end. Um, if everything works perfectly, there's no difference between the two. It's only in the way that they fail that you notice the difference. Uh, so we don't have a lot of time. Uh, we might have to breeze through some examples. Do you want to give this one to you? Yeah. Uh, so we end up tethering a lot. Um, we've seen teams tether over USB and try to run uh, USB tethers on a practice field. Um, it's not something we would recommend. We've done it a couple of times. Uh, almost always, you end up breaking the USB connection at the reel um, because you, your robot goes out of control. You veer to the side or something else. The USB cables are shorter. Yeah, the USB cables are also shorter. Uh, so we decided we're going to tether pretty much only by USB. Uh, the, oh, sorry, by Ethernet. But the, the issue is that the radio has only two ports. Uh, one port goes to the reel, one port goes to our camera usually. Uh, so we need some other way of tethering. Um, adding a switch in, that's great. But how do you wire it up? So in this scenario here, our radio um, is always going to be connected to the FMS, and the radio is connected directly to the reel. If this switch fails, it doesn't kill the radio, it doesn't kill the reel. 
the only consequence of the switch failing is that we lose our camera. It doesn't kill the rest of the robot. If you don't wire it up in this way and you have your Rio plugged into the switch, then the failure of the switch kills the Rio and your robot's dead. So you would have introduced an additional point of failure if you don't wire it up appropriately. So in this case, we considered the failure modes and what happens if each of these things dies. If the radio dies, it doesn't matter. Your robot's dead anyway. If the Rio dies, it doesn't matter. Your robot's dead anyway. But we added the switch. So what's the consequence of adding the switch? What's going to die if the switch dies? And everything upstream of that dies, which in this case is the camera. We could live without the camera. Um, we can't live without the radio and the Rio. So the convenience of adding the switch in is that otherwise every time you tether, you have to unplug something and you have to plug it back in. If you forget to plug that thing back <coughs> in, you've added a potential failure mode. So adding something to prevent one failure may come at the cost of introducing another failure mode. Uh, here's a good example of that. Uh, we lost finals in Ontario champs uh, of our division because we put a guard uh, on over our, our switch. We actually had a guard there before that got smashed off. So that first guard did his job. And then we needed a new guard in a hurry. So we bent up this Lexan thing. And um, you might even already notice the, the issue with the design. Immediately in our first match, uh, we took the cargo ship at a sharp corner. Uh, the cargo ship has a sort of an overhang there, which got right in on top of that Lexan guard and did what? Push the button. So it actually turned a little red button into a giant plastic patter that the cargo ship's really good at pushing. So I robot powered off middle of that match. So sometimes gu guards, barriers actually make things worse. You have to be really careful. Uh, it's not easy, especially when you're rushing in a hurry. Um, I don't really have any lessons to learn from that other than think carefully and test thoroughly. So we moved the, the uh, main breaker in a little bit. That was our guard. Yeah, yeah, rather than have the right? guard. So rather than, the this is a good example of that. Rather than the barrier, right? Remember I had a, or, um, uh, an order of, uh, of barriers, order of, of things you can do to minimize risk. The, the order of that's important. So the barrier is a step down the list. Instead, minimize the risk to begin with. So put the switch down in here, and it's not a problem. Like robot and cargo ships can't reach it. And you don't even need the barrier anymore. Um, we'll kind of breeze by this uh, because Stan talked about it. But uh, checklists are fantastic. Do them. Right. So, uh, like, if you you're not doing a system check, you should be doing a system check. So, very briefly, uh, system check. Run every single m mechanism and function of your robot before every match. So, in your pit, you come back, you think everything's great. Try everything out. You change your battery. So we generally do it um, on an old battery. We try everything out, press every button, do every combination, uh, check that everything works, and then we'll, we'll charge air um, on the old battery, and then we'll change the battery just before the match. Um, have a checklist. Have someone who's going to go and check every bolt that you know that loosens. Um, they're going to take an Allen key. They're going to go check every bolt, ensure it's tight. They're going to feel every chain. They're going to go and check all the wheels that they're not worn. They're going to go and check all the switches that you've got. That they've got to go through every single one of those items on that checklist before the next match. And of course, have a packing list. We've forgotten a bunch of stuff over time. We add them to the packing list and ensure you actually have like two or three people look over that packing list. Um, have people verify that things that you want made it onto the list and that things that are on the list actually got packed. Yes? Do you guys find it better to text your robot before a game or directly after a game? Both. Both. So I was just going to say that. So 100% do it just before the match. But if that's the only time you're doing, this is what we actually used to do only just before a match. And the problem is, is what happens when you find something doesn't work. Now you've got three minutes and you're already on the second call for two of it, right? Um, so one thing that, that uh, we're doing a lot better at is uh, running system checks um, before any long break. So before we all leave for lunch, for instance, we do a system check. After any code change or any repair, immediately afterwards, we do a system check. Because you don't want to assume it works perfectly. Go off, have a nice casual lunch. Come back and say, oh yeah, our match is in five minutes. Let's do a system check and oh crap, right? Um, so both do system checks lots. They don't take long time, not a long time. Like I think a system check is probably 90 seconds long or something. Just, uh, you'll hear us if, you're, if you come to see us in the pit. 
you'll hear our students call out. Um, they they call, out they call out verbally, so they'll usually. say like, um, go to X, go to X, go, go to y. y, intake out, intake in, blah blah, blah. and they'll be yelling it out because uh, the robot's loud, and we'll watch that thing go. And by the time they get uh, to their third or fourth competition, they it's just routine. It's really great. And that also fun like. Ensure that your robot can drive, even if it's on blocks, ensure that the wheels are spinning in the right direction and everything. Um, so, if you take nothing else from this talk, do system checks. 100%. Um, you probably already do, most students do. And, like, even when you arrive at a competition, we are guilty of doing this. We often say, okay, we've got a robot, it's working fine. Yeah. We arrive at a competition, we leisurely unpack, set up our pit, and it's like two hours later, we decide, okay, now let's turn a robot on and actually try it. Do that as early as you can. The very first instant that you get to turn on your robot at a competition, turn it on, run your robot, and see that it's, it's working. And if you can, get onto the practice field. If you've got all this extra time, go and practice. Uh, you know, like, uh, do pra run practice matches or something. Uh, get a feel for the, the, the field over there. We're, we're going to have to skip most of this because of timing, sadly. Um, to Stan talked a little bit about this, uh, but what we can do is, uh, well, the general purpose of this slide is to say, what you only have 10 qual matches, so think about how you're gonna make those win. Wins are built before the queuing line, okay? Um, especially upset wins. Uh, some, we'll, we'll show some really good examples of, of how we prepped before a competition, especially those later competitions when performances are already known about teams, um, maybe the schedule's already released, you can do uh, a lot of pre-scouting. Um, you can do really good, strong strategy meetings. Um, uh, 20, 20 foot six is very, very good at communicating between their scouts and their drivers in order to plan those strategy sessions. Um, one last little example, and, and Tyler probably talked about that in his talk. He's, uh, if you watch, uh, Holtzman is the last person to leave the field always. He sits there and stands on the field until everyone else goes, until the refs yell at him to get off because he wants to make sure it's all set up exactly the way that it should be and there's no and the field's right and there's no debris on the field and the robots are set up right and he does not leg it all the chance. Uh, okay, so um, in 2018, uh, we had uh, an RP assurance team. Um, rank points were really important in 2018, been important the last few years. Um, so the <coughs> job of our RP assurance team was to help us secure the climate RP in every match that we could. So what we had was, um, we had a double climb. Uh, we had a ramp that fell out. You had to get onto our ramp, and, you had to, and, and we would lift you up. Um, the way that we secured that rank point was we would look at our two uh, alliance partners, generally uh, four or five matches in advance if we could. We would go to their pit. We would look at their robot. We would see how much ground clearance they had. We had a spare ramp that we had built. We would take this ramp to their pit. We would see if we could fit it under their robot. Um, if there were multiple options, we would try and get them onto the practice field. So our team and their team would go to the practice field, we would try to practice a climb. They would come, they would try to line up. If you've done it, if it's the first time you're ever trying to get onto someone else's robot in the middle of a match with 15 seconds left to go, chances are it's not gonna work. If you've had a chance to try it, if they've had a chance to see these are your sight lines, this is what's gonna come in the way, this is the angle you need to get on. If you've tried it three or four times, it makes it so much easier. And then we would go, in, if needed, like in, uh, at, during a limbs, uh, if we needed to uh, work on, uh, uh, help another team, get a robot that was uh, easier to get onto our ramp, maybe add a little bit of uh, a piece of lex sand somewhere so that it would guide it on easier, something like that would help guarantee those, the rank point, those climb points as needed. So working in advance, not just during the match. This was all set up in advance. Everything was done three, four, five matches in advance to try and know who was going to climb, when they were going to climb, what was going to happen if their robot was dead on the field, um, how, what was our contingency plan, would we scrap the climb, would another robot climb, what was the second backup plan. All of that should be in place in advance. And we had a team of three dedicated to that. And it worked really well. We climbed, um, mo we, well, attempted to climb anyway. And I think we had two people fall off. but. Um, including Torben Fire, who's apologizing for everyone who is. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but um, we, uh, but those three people were a really, really big part of our success in 2018. Um, and, and practicing, um, 
you know, that, that goes without saying, um, but especially in 2020, right? You don't have to bag your robot. So finish your robot at the same time. Finish your robot February 28th or whatever, and then come to a practice field. There are now lots in the GTA HA. Um, there, there, are, there are tons. Um, there's at least a half dozen. Uh, ours in the Robodrome, uh, come see us if you want to learn more about that. Uh, is, is open to other teams. Uh, this is a great shot I have. I think we've got four, this is just for Mac, and, the, and four of the top five teams at McMaster were, were in this room practicing together uh, the, the week before. Uh, and now we, that's expensive to do. It was expensive to do that year because you had to build two robots, but that no longer exists. So there's no excuse. You should all show up to a, uh, an event with a practice working robot, um, and we can help with that. Come. We're going to actually run a uh, no, no details yet for time and schedule, but we're going to run a first aid event in late February, um, which is a time when we're going to invite teams into our, our, uh, our practice field and our, our shop uh, called the Robodrome um, to just do the things we would normally do on first aid competition, which is we're going to get your robot playing the game. I, it's hell or high water. It's not going to be what you wanted. It's not going to be, uh, um, uh, be pretty maybe. But in, but in the next four hours, we're, this thing is going to play, and, and that's going to get you ready for the game, um, especially for the teams that are really struggling. So at that point, if you're already there, then just come to practice. But the first aid is going to be for those emergency uh, bandages for those teams that uh, would otherwise show up the competition with a robot that doesn't work. And, and that should, in, in 2020, this is why I'm a big proponent of No Bag Day, should never happen again. Good question. Going to build only one robot. Uh, uh, the jury's still out on that one. <laughs> We're not sure yet. Uh, there, are, we've, we've had good arguments in favor of one robot and in favor of two robots, um, and uh, yeah, we're still deciding. Yes. On the last robot, there's some cool like decision points. What's that? Oh, um, so. That's something oh, we train. Yeah. I wish we could we have some more time. Maybe we'll come back. We're almost into lunch now, but um, we. Uh, the match often has, uh, this year was less so, but this year oh, had this a decision point. This year had a time, yeah. when are you going to start your climb, yeah. right? Because when you start your climb means you're not scoring anymore. Or when are you going to pull your defense back? Or when are you, are you going to run your defense or are you going to run free offense? All of these are decision points. And in two minutes, it's not enough. I mean, especially for me, I'm slow. You should see my squash game. It's terrible. Um, that, like, uh, the, I, I can't, can't make those decisions fast, right? So you want to know ahead of time What's the decision tree? Like when, by 30 seconds, has this happened? By 60 seconds, has this happened? Are you, and, and a really good example is 2018. Um, 2018 was rough because it wasn't, it wasn't a linear point scale. You couldn't really look at the score and say, are you going to win the match, right? Because what you were scoring was a rate. So I really wish that year they had changed the score to show like graphs, like linear graphs, because you actually, to predict who was going to win, you needed to know the rate at which the both teams were scoring right now. So we trained our drive team to look at a scoreboard instantly. We did flashcards. We're like, okay, here's the scoreboard. One, four, three, two, one. Who's going to win? And what they had to get from that in five seconds was how much time is left in the match, who's got control of the scale, who's got control of both switches, and if nothing else changes, what's that going to add up to in that... 30 seconds that are left, or the 60 seconds that are left. And it, you know, the, the drive team failed miserably the first time we did that. But, but we kept running that drill, and they got really, really good, like, like crazy good, um, which was awesome. It's what you needed to do in order to make those decisions on should I focus on the scale, in that case, should I go to climb because we've got this match in the bag. Or we're going to lose this match no matter what, so I should work on the climb and use all the time I can to get that RP, right? Um, yeah, so that's a big thing. Like, if you know you're going to lose a match, don't, like, if it's, like, a minute left, you're down, like, two robots, you know you're going to lose a match, don't keep on going and trying to score points in a match you're not going to win. Ensure that you can do whatever you can to get the rank points. Like, get something out of the match instead of getting a loss and no rank points. So we've done before, we've had a dead robot, we've pushed the dead robot onto the platform. So you spend 20 seconds pushing the dead robot on, you weren't going to win the match anyway, but you can get that dead robot onto the platform, and then you can do your climb, and it takes you 40 seconds to do all of that. Fine, but you got the rank point out of it, instead of getting no rank points because you had uh, a dead robot and a, a losing a score at that point. Yeah. 
So that's an important decision to make. Um, the decision might be how do you win the match if it's a close match, um, or what can you do if it's a, a, a match you're losing, um, or if you're winning, um, what matters in the match now. If you're already 200 points ahead of the match, um, and then you just get the win and you don't get that additional rank point, that cost you something. Even though you won the match, you didn't get as many, you didn't maximize the potential of that game. Uh, so trying to get all of those things at the right time is important. Yeah, so I, I uh, had harder debriefs with the drive team this year when we walked away from matches with zero or one RP, right? Um, it happened a lot in champs, it happened a lot in IRI because we got greedy, you know, where, where we really pushed for four RP, we really pushed for a win, and in doing so, we didn't leave enough time <coughs> to climb, and we didn't give ourselves that backup. So, you know, it's, um, it's tough. It's tough to decide whether to be really ambitious in the context of a, uh, of a three minute match. Um, but if you know the decision points ahead of time for the most optimal uh, outcome, then, then you should know, okay, we haven't locked in the win by this point, at least we should get this bonus RP. And know what your robot can do. Um, so like our robot could climb under perfect circumstances in like three and a half, four seconds maybe. Um, our drive team needed to be like at the platform, lining up at like six seconds. Um, if we had a new drive team, they needed to be, they needed to stop what they were doing and be there at 30 seconds in order to get that climb in. Um, so know the capabilities of your, of your team and when you need to do things, right? It's not just, oh, our robot's got a three second climb, great. Uh, no, it, you have to have time to line up, time for someone to get in your way, time for you to get around defense. So and the, plan and all of that. The match matters too. Like if it's match three on Einstein finals, uh, <coughs> we'll try for second place. Right? Yeah. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll sorry, I, I'm carrying away uh, into our time limit here, but we're going to go into what I think is the, the most important lesson from um, what we've done over the past four years, the reason why self have gotten better and better every year is because we have this process of continuous improvement. Uh, and I'll just go right into the next one. Uh, so the, the most important thing, this is the second thing I'd like you to take away from this presentation if you take nothing else, uh, which is do debriefs. We do debriefs after every single competition. And there are lots of ways to do this. The way we've uh, settled on is we break up a whiteboard into three columns. Worked, didn't work, and do differently. And do differently doesn't mean something that didn't work. It, it mostly means ideas that we've seen, right? So what worked? And, and hopefully that list is long. Sometimes it's not. Didn't work. That one, list is often long. And we really, really try and encourage everyone to be open and creative and like, you know, don't, don't be shy. Don't think you're criticizing people. Um, put it all out there. Um, and do differently all the ideas, so keep an eye out. We fill this board, and then that takes a whole night, usually. Um, then we start thinking over the next couple days, what do we do to fix this, right? So never assume that something that didn't work is a fluke. Too many people do that. Or too many people say, ah, it's operator error. Uh, Drivetrain chain broke. Ah, somebody must have put it together wrong, right? Okay, someone put it together wrong. How are we gonna make sure that doesn't happen next time, right? Or maybe we're pushing the limits of um, the reliability of that chain and that application. We should go one size up, right? Um, Think hard about it. Don't just say, ah, whatever, it was because of that dummy over there. <coughs> That's the easiest thing to do. It's really easy. You see it all the time in politics and things. It's really easy to blame people for failures because you can write it all off and you don't have to take any blame yourself. You don't have to do anything differently. But do things differently when you see something wrong. One thing to add to this, don't only do this when something doesn't work. Um, mm. We do this if we win a competition. We do this if we don't perform as we want. All the time you do this. Um, this, the idea that didn't work gets shorter over the course of the season. Uh, but do it all the time. Um, every, every competition you go to, win, lose, tie, doesn't matter, analyze your performance. What made it a good competition? What didn't make it a good competition? Look at it all the time. Uh, the, this, yeah, yeah. We, this was something we, uh, we went to IRI a couple of years ago and a, and a team did this. Uh, the engineers did this at IRI. Um, don't be afraid to take ideas from some other team. They, they've got a, a great idea, use it. Um, it's a collaborative environment. Uh, so we started uh, recording our matches. So we've always recorded the matches uh, from the stands uh, with a, a camera, just record the full field of all the matches. Uh, we have a copy of that. Uh, but uh, we then started recording our robot. So take a tablet, 
some some student is going to follow the our robot for the entire match that we play in. Um, and then right after that match, we're going to take that tablet, hand it to our drive team, and they're going to look at what went wrong, what did they do well, how did they respond to different circumstances. It's that instant replay. Five minutes after the match, they've got a copy of it on a tablet, and they're reviewing it. Uh, that process of reviewing, of, this, of uh, debriefing, what went well, what didn't go well, what would you change next time, um, how did you respond to a particular si uh, situation, having it in video form is great. Um, the tablet's good because it's got a big screen. You don't need to have it recorded on a camera, transfer the SD card to a, a laptop and watch it. This is right away, someone hands it off. We've extended that to also do this in the limbs. So in the limbs, we take four tablets, Someone records the field, someone records each of the robots. Generally, we give it to the team, our alliance partners. Um, you record your own robot, and then as an alliance, each uh, team looks at their robot, does a debrief, and then as an alliance, we'll do a little debrief together after each match, win or lose. Um, we still want to know how we could improve. So uh, that's made a big difference. It's really good for drive strategy um, and for learning from each match. Uh, so a lot of the time, steal ideas from other uh, teams. Just a couple of quick examples. You know, it's steal is a bad word, but um, but there are three thousand teams in FRC, and all of them are thinking hard. Uh, and so you're not going to be able to sell, solve all the problems they are. So you learn from them. And actually, a lot of teams, including us, uh, like to share data. Uh, we we often post things on our Twitter account. Um, some teams do completely open things, so they share their their CAD uh, online. There's, I think there's going to be launch something called the Open Open Alliance or something next year where people will, will register. I really encourage this. I know it's different teams have different philosophies, um, but my philosophy is that uh, teams that win <coughs> win because of good ideas. Ideas are cheap. Really, ideas are cheap. Like you'll find this in, in the real world. Um, uh, despite what the patent law uh, clerks will tell you, ideas are cheap. Execution on the ideas is where the value is. Um, so, so find as many ideas as you can and then, and then do the Good ones, right? So, some quick examples. In 2014, there was all there was a we had a playbook this thick. I was on makeshift in that case. Playbook this thick of different ways that the game was evolving, and just keeping that uh, uh, on a, a 1325 went further than us. Now you're gonna give you guys even a bigger playbook that we did. Um, in 2015, we learned how we had a really great robot in 2015 um, that did its job really efficiently, just making stacks and putting them on the thing. Um, and it became a bottle, the human player became a bottleneck, just getting enough totes into the damn robot in the two and a half minute match. And so <laughs> we had these ergonomic studies where we were like, okay, how do we get him to turn less? How do we get him to bend less? We ended up making a table out of totes just in front of the chute and having two people. So you were, you could pass across a line, you couldn't have two people on the thing, but you could pass a tote onto that table so the person loading the chute could just pivot like this and didn't have to bend down, was at working height here to here, here to here, here to here. And like little things like that. Um, it was an idea we wouldn't have thought of, but we actually stole that from another team. Uh, this is a picture of, uh, yeah, but uh, uh, Pittsburgh in 2016. Um, we went, to, we got picked in the finals, and Team 1126 uh, said, uh, okay, you're part of our team, here is a camera on a pole. We were like, what is that? And they said, nah, 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 use the camera on the pole. And it was brilliant because uh, there were all these defenses and you could see over them. We had a little screen, they had a little screen built in that pole so you could see over them, see what was going on on the other side. And that was killer for our alliance. It was a real competitive advantage. So the very first thing we did after our debrief uh, was make another camera on a pole. And all, by the end of the year, almost every team had one of these things. Um, but, you know, steal, stealing that idea is good. All kinds of other ones. Gear hiding, we, we uh, stole from 2056. Uh, 2018, also the uh, uh, hiding the um, the power ups to the very last yeah. second. All kinds of neat tricks. 2056 got lots of neat tricks. Learn from them. Um, yeah. Uh, so, uh, scouting. Our team used to scout on paper, um, and our scouts hated it. Um, they, 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 they didn't, they didn't, not that they, they hated the paper scouting, there was nothing particularly wrong with that. Um, but they didn't see value in the scouting. So we used to have pretty much, you would scout every match, you'd spend two days scouting all these matches, uh, a couple of kids would come out to the scouting meeting, the, uh, determine the pick list. If you weren't an alliance captain, well, there was no point to this pick list a lot of the time. So it was, we did all this work for nothing. Uh, we've changed that strategy around. So firstly, 
we did a scouting app. Um, we did the scouting app because kids like to be on their phones and on tablets. It's more engaging. It's less cognitive effort. It's much easier to press a button every time something happens than it is to try and keep track of how many times things happen on which robot and whatever else. So everything, it, well, all the, the, the could cognitive, be yeah, yeah, a lot of the, the cognitive things of like which robot are you scouting, all of those things, filling in the number, all of that's taken away. They don't have to worry about any of that. They just have to tap an action. Um, so that, that makes it a lot easier to do. It means they don't get tired as easily. They can be more attentive to the task. Uh, beyond that though, Use your scouting data every match. So the scouting data shouldn't be just for this one pick list. It should inform the next match's strategy. We go into our strategy meeting saying, okay, this robot did so many cycles in the previous matches. This robot played really good defense. It allows us to help to uh, set a strategy for a match. If your scouts know that their data is being valued all the time, if they can see that it's informing strategy, oh, we said that this robot uh, had an issue, uh, someone went and fixed that issue, someone went and looked at that and, and made a change to it. If their data is valued, scouting becomes much more rewarding. If it's not as tiring, scouting becomes much more rewarding. We generally try to rotate through, um, and we have mentors, we have student leaders scout. Don't let it be just the rookies who scout because that's the only thing that they can do. For sure, have uh, if you have your drive coach come and scout and talk to the scouts and say, oh, what did you guys see and take notes and everything else, uh, it increases the value of scouting and it makes it much more fun. We've got kids who love to scout, um, but uh, having that data be valued, having their contribution be important to the team is key to that. Something we learned from 2056 last year. Um, the, the, the app also gives us real-time data, which is great. And, and obviously not everyone can implement this, although there are some, some open source things online you can use to start with. Um, some teams have shared their scouting apps. Uh, but we get we get really good data out of this uh, app. It's been fantastic last year. It, it was one of the lessons learned from 2018 was that our scouting wasn't great. Um, and, uh, and that cost us a little bit. Our scouting was much, much better this year. Um, something else, a really nice tie-in story with this is um, our scouts now maintain a dead robot list during mm -hmm. competition. Uh, so everyone, there was a thread on our, on our messaging system use Basecamp. Um, there's a thread on Basecamp of dead robot list <coughs> competition, and whenever each student who is watching a robot, you know, you might miss something if you're just watching the whole game, right? You're not looking at the robots that necessarily are failed, but one kid is. So that kid will say, ah, Team XXX uh, failed uh, at this event, and they'll post a dead robot list. We have a roving repair crew, and that's their first target. In, in 10 minutes, when that robot comes off the field, they go there and they figure out what's wrong with that robot, not only because um, they might play with us, they may not, we've already played with them once, we may not, but we might use them in, in, in playoffs. Um, and, and otherwise, it's, it's good just to keep the competition going well, but it's also good to know, you know, uh, why did that robot fail? Was it a fluke? Was it, was the robot a giant hot mess? Um, was it, uh, it uh, just, you know, bad luck or the, the controller got unplugged, you know? Um, we we want to know those things. So. It also gives that really awesome tie-in between the, the scouting team and the pit team and the drive team. Uh, okay, so that's scouting. Uh, I won't spend too much time on that, uh, but we do some off-season testing. And the rest of the uh, um, presentation is just about kind of examples of where we've learned some lessons. So that's kind of the meat of, of our four-part lesson to, to Foiling Murphy. Um, we're definitely into off, off time and your lunch time, so don't feel uh, bad about going off to get some food right now. But if you want to stay, we'll go through some of these things and we'll, we'll take questions. <coughs> What's your strategy in terms of picking uh, tournaments? Like, which ones are you going to like? Well, one early, on one way to in the middle. Oh, picking tournaments. Oh, so picking our, our strategy is, is somewhat fixed in the sense of uh, um, we have to do a local event. We do the local event because uh, it's a cheap event for our students. It's a place where sponsors can come out. So we're from Hamilton. We try to go to McMaster. So that was our first. We didn't put a, like, that was, we have to go. We, to the best of our ability, we we're going to try to get into Mac. So we, that was our first preference. No second event listed. We, we got <coughs> Mac as our first preference for this year. And we've done that for the last few years. And it's exactly for that reason. It's not necessarily that it's, and we like that it's a late event. Um, but it's, uh, it's a fun event because it's really competitive. 
We enjoy the competitiveness of that event, um, but we also need the local event so that our kids don't have to pay travel fees. They don't have to stay in a hotel. Um, we can invite sponsors out. We can invite parents out. Uh, so that's always our, our first pick in, in terms of the event we go to. Uh, the second event, um, we generally try to pick an event that's like a week three, four kind of event. Um, we want a little space between our events, and we don't want a really early event. We know that um, we, we like to push limits, and having a first week event is not going to work in our favor. We, don't, we, we might have a decent robot by then, but we like to add some stuff on. We like to have the, the, the time to perfect things, or, or improve upon things, I say perfect. Um, so having a week three, four event is good. It also coincides nicely with March break, so it limits the amount of days that we tend to lose to school or anything else, uh, or school days we lose and it gives us a chance maybe to get some work done over the March break. So those tend to be where we like to pick our events. We're still debating our second event. Yeah. Uh, and that might change. Like, so historically, we've had a competitive advantage with a practice field. We didn't have the practice field until our second year. Um, uh, that we had the ability to improve, whereas a lot of teams who bagged one robot didn't. So we knew at later events we would have a competitive advantage uh, if we kept practicing while others couldn't. Right. Um, that's gone away now, so so that might be different. A lot of teams I've, I've noticed in the, the picking in this first round, a lot of uh, the week ones are the most important, um, or, or the most popular. So a lot of teams are, are betting that there's going to be a lot more improvement generally this year, and so they want to take their chances with their first event, uh, just because they think they can uh, they can build a good robot within the time they have. Um, and so I, I don't know. I don't know the right answer to that. Uh, I think the examples are the interesting ones, so. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, um, we had versus Planetaries. Um, our climber in 2017, every five matches, uh, it was overgeared. Um, we had, like, it was 100 to 1. We would always be checking um, that we aren't, uh, that our, our gears aren't too. We have, I think we found every single failure mode of a versus Planetary at this point. Um, we have stripped ring gears, carriers, the, the suns, the planets, everything. Has, has, has not worked for us. Um, so we have just given up mostly on Versa Planetaries. We keep them in stock for prototyping, um, but on our robot, we pretty much just use 57 sports. Uh, they can't mess them up because they are pre-assembled. The students won't build them wrong, um, and uh, they are warranted again in competition, and they work well. Uh, you might have to click play on that. Oh, can't click play on that. Play. Oh, there we go. This was McMaster. This was a few seconds of McMaster. This is our robot over here. Um, this was driver station wall. That's auto. Yeah. That's, uh, this that's, is auto. That's not a scoring location, by the way. That's, yes. <laughs> um, I think that's one of the few exceptions if you can uh, actually reach over the line in auto to uh, do something because that cube would have landed right on their driver station. That wasn't an auto problem. It might look like one. It wasn't an auto problem. Uh, sure, sure. So it was a CAN bus problem. Um, can, we like using CAN bus. We'll talk about why in a moment. Um, most of the modern controllers um, have a CAN bus connection so rather than a PWM connection. Very detailed thing. But uh, it's two wires. It's a bus. It's one, two wires that go to all the things like an Ethernet, like almost. Um, and there's some real advantage to that uh, in terms of the amount of wire that's out there in the terms of failure points. But uh, again, with these concept failure modes and consequences, uh, one failure in that CAN bus can take down everything downstream of that failure. And look, that's what happened there. Half, we, we wired that robot up one side of the drivetrain, up the arm to the, all the arm mechanisms, down to the other side of the drivetrain. And, um, you know, you brought, bring CAN bus up the arm is a lot of moving parts, so a connector failed up there. So we lost half the side of the robot. So it ran auto, but only half the robot responded to auto and went in circles. Still did the arm movements, right? through the cube up there. So we, we <coughs> again, we did our, our debrief. Uh, we looked at how are we going to fix this. And now we use these things. Uh, they're called IDC connectors, ins insulation displacement connectors. <coughs> the same kind you find in Ethernet. <coughs> um, Ethernet ends are IDC. So what they do is they, they put a little blade into the wire uh, and and don't cut the wire. So that, no problem. Uh, so the wire never breaks. So we have one loop of wire that goes to all our CAN bus devices. Um, and that wire never breaks. It's, it's just tapped off of. So any one failure here is not going to take down the bus. So 
we used to have so the, the traditional um, way that like uh, CTRE recommends that you, you wire these is a daisy chain. It is still exactly the same electrically. Um, you go from the Rio to the PDP, there is a wire that runs to them, and then uh, you come off of that to each device. The daisy chain method has like a zero inch stubble. <coughs> The, it, the wire comes and terminates on the PCB, off the motor controller. <coughs> Here, we run a single wire from the Rio to the PDP. Ferrules at both ends, um, and then we tap off of that. Um, the only way then to, to break the chain is to break the main bus. Everything else has the 12 inch stub that comes with the motor controller, and if that stub breaks, it only affects that one item. Um, so it's, it's really resilient. We didn't have a single CAN bus failure last year, yeah, um, whereas we had a myriad of them the year before. We used to use Anderson connectors for our CAN bus. Not a great idea. Um, wouldn't recommend it. Uh, they were, the advantage of them was that they were locking, um, but the cable, the CAN bus cable is too thin, and crimping onto them is not really very nice. So you rewired your robot mid-season? Uh, no, we, this was a by design. We, we, we came up with this over the course of the summer uh, last year. Um, we tried it at Ruckus. Uh, we, we did the Rochester Ruckus. We tried it there, worked beautifully, and then we used that design all year. Um, and all of our robots that we've built, off-season projects and everything else since then, have all had that style of uh, IDC connector. Uh, by the way, it comes in two styles. There is a clear one and there is an opaque one. Go with the clear one. Um, it's easy to plug these in badly so that they come off to the side. If you're going to do this, use the clear ones so you can actually see the wires inside. Where do you get it from? Uh, Amazon. Okay. Amazon sells them. Uh, you can get them AliExpress uh, in China, wherever else. Super I know bright LEDs .com. Super bright LEDs. Yeah, yeah. it's like uh, so we, we buy we buy 50 or 60. They're generally they're, they they are also locking, so they actually uh, click nice. closed, which is really nice. Um, might take a little force to do them. Uh, generally wouldn't recommend reusing them. Uh, so they're one time use, they're also a little cheaper than Anderson's. Mm -hmm. um, but they are really have been have proven to be awesome for us. Some other really quick wiring uh, suggestions. So go to Home Depot and uh, or to Home Depot or to Princess Auto and buy these cam lock connectors and strap your battery down. It's, we, we carry about three extra of these to competition. And almost always when we're fixing up a third robot before playoffs, we're installing one of these because people don't strap their battery in. Um, it's the cheapest thing, uh, you know, well, five bucks, <coughs> like that, but, but it's great, easy to, it does not come undone, um, easy to install, yep. So I assume we can't, the bus is horizontal here, it's only four wires? Oh, there are two. Uh, there are two. No, there's two, two connectors there's, there. There's a connector at the back and a connector yeah, at the front. Yeah, it's just an example, sorry. Yeah, so we have, we, we have the one yellow and green wire, it's terminated with ferrules and plugged into the Rio, and then that mm -hmm. twisted pair runs all the way to the PDP, mm -hmm. we untwist the little section, stick on our IDC connector and, and work with that. So it's, it's uh, we, we make a big loop of that, keep a little extra wire. Um, the one thing about neat wiring that sometimes is bad is that you cut it right to the perfect length. Um, I would keep a little extra, have a little bundle of wire somewhere so you have that flexibility. <coughs> uh, we also put a zip tie, uh, Stan mentioned this too, on the SP50 connector between the battery and the robot. Uh, we didn't do this in 2017 and it cost us uh, a semifinals match to Team Day. Um, so, uh, add ferrules to Wade Mueller's, um, so the, the, we can explain those later, but there, there are little things that make the wire uh, less, yeah. less chance to so, so that the ferrules are crimp-on connectors on the end of your wires, um, otherwise you have loose wire strands, um, they will short against each other, they don't plug in as nicely, uh, ferrules work great, but um, ensure sure you have the right sure ferrules. CTRE ferrules seem to work terribly. Uh, no, sorry, Andy Mark ferrules seem to work terribly for us. CTRE ferrules work great. Um, the Andy Mark ones, for whatever reason, they just pull out, um, whereas the CTRE ones hold in nicely. Uh, the cheap Chinese ones don't work very well for us either, for that one. Um, POE? Uh, POE, um, if you don't know what that is, uh, you should. Uh, th it's recently become legal. Um, but it's a way to add power to the radio, to re uh, <coughs> redundant power to the radio, um, and it's great. Do it because uh, the rate that little uh, power connector to the radio often comes undone. Right. So there are two aspects of that. One is that the Ethernet is locking; you can't pull it out easily, uh, whereas the barrel jack is, is easy to pull out. And the second one is it's a redundant power. Use both the barrel jack and the Ethernet. 
So if either of the, well, if the Ethernet comes out, you're pretty much toast anyway. But if the uh, barrel jack comes out, uh, you still have power. Um, so it's two separate powers. What's the uh, position on um, yeah. securing connections to a hot, hot screw guy? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm okay with it, honestly. Um, they, they, it makes maintenance harder. Um, the, there are also some 3D printed options. Presumably you mean like in the real? Yeah. Yeah, like in here. This is one of the reasons why we use CAN bus is because there's only, there's only one Wade Miller connector here. There's not the little, um, uh, I can't remember what they're called. Uh, oh, they're, connections, uh, but it doesn't matter. Yeah, DuPont. DuPont, DuPont connectors, which are really loose and often come undone. So yeah, I, Cog fully knows I'm totally okay with that. Um, some inspectors give you a hard time about it. Uh, there are also 3D printed things that can go on a rail and hold those down, but our solution has been to um, try to not have anything in there. Uh, there are also some carrier boards where they would expose uh, <laughs> yeah. terminals, and then you can just put the wires in and screw them on instead of um, putting the PWMs in. You had a question? Um, yeah. So is there a point, like, first of all, is there some things that are better to hot glue than others? Can you, like, in a system like that, you can't just use it as the edge for other glue, you can't use that as a glue? Um, and I mean, it's not impossible to remove hot glue. Yeah. yeah. I, so I'd say that we don't hot glue a lot. Not anymore. Um, we used to. We, we used to, um, but we've largely moved away from it. So almost everything <coughs> that we have is ferrules mm -hmm. and then locking connectors. Um, so if it, if it doesn't make a, a positive like locking connection, we mm -hmm. generally try to stay away from it. Yeah, so uh, the question is, what was your other yeah. solution? Yeah, so yeah. Anderson connectors and all power things mm -hmm. with a lock. Yeah. Um, so have the retention clip. Um, IDC connectors on um, all CAN bus things. Um, terminals, if possible, where you can. So if you have like screw-in terminals, that's fine. Uh, we use the uh, Wago lever nuts occasionally, but very, very rarely. Never like by design. Usually like a need a really quick fix. Um, we uh, try to limit our soldering actually, just because it's uh, it, it's easy to mess up and uh, it breaks very easily. Um, but uh, crimping is, is is a good thing for us um, and. Uh, ferrules, IDC connectors, those are the ones that we generally go with. Space, can you just go back yeah. for a second? <coughs> um, yeah, we're sending a little Maria to uh, National Instruments. Yeah, they do an RMA. No, no uh, if, it's, if it's got a failure. Yeah. So yeah. We, we've had uh, we've had Rios with broken e USB ports from tethering. We've had Rios with metal shavings inside that have uh, that kind of get into the conformal coating and cause uh, a short like power you, you get power fault. And, and I, it turns out, really awesome about it. They'll replace yeah. it. So you call them, uh, you tell them what the problem is. They might help you. If it's a, if it's a problem that's fixable, they might help you to fix it. Mm -hmm. But if it's a physically damaged Rio, Rios are expensive. <coughs> um, but because they're sponsoring the program, they will set up an RMA. It comes through AndyMark. Um, so AndyMark will ship out new ones, and then you ship back the old ones, and they will take them back, refurbish them, do whatever they need to. Um, you don't always get brand new Rios, but they'll be refurbished and fully functional, um, which is better than the one you're returning. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, pneumatic line system is a similar kind of thing. We learned about uh, just small little things, like the line between the compressor, right off the compressor and the tank. Uh, we, we've been switching to like a soft tube recently because you can do shorter bends and it's easier to work with. Um, but turns out that it has a lower temperature limit. And so this year we had a failure where that tube actually shrunk enough that it wouldn't connect in any of our connectors anymore right off the compressor. So now that line in our design is always a higher temperature, stiffer plastic, which is weird. We never would have thought of that, but you know, you learn your lessons. And we've also switched to compression fittings instead of the push to connect fittings. Um, I'm not saying you have to do that. Actually, lots of teams have had better experience with push to connect. In 2017, 2016, we had a hell of a time with our pneumatics. And I think it was probably more to do with the batch of tubing we had just wasn't really good. But the compression fittings are more tolerant of all kinds of different tubing. So they, they're a little harder to put together. Um, and I, I have mentors who want to go back to push to connects. Um, but this has been you know something we decided during the debrief a couple years ago that, that uh, reduces our error potential. Uh, they're easy to over tighten. Uh, but if they're done well, uh, they tend to last a lot longer. They add a little weight to the robot, but we've been really big fans of them. Schedules are good. Schedules are good. Yeah, I think I think we're here on it. <laughs> so I, I'm sorry, we had so many neat ideas that we tend to go on and on, but um, 
want to make sure you still have a bit of time to get some lunch. But also, we're going to be here, and so feel free to ask questions now or later if you like. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My, my favorite tube is some stuff, um, it, it's bonded to, it comes in pairs mm -hmm. from Automation Direct. It's like clear, it's like blue, black. Can you repeat that? Too? Automation Direct, A-U-T-O-M-A-T-I-O-N. <coughs> uh, They're our first sponsor. They're our first sponsor. They, 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 they give you a you voucher. Get, you get a little voucher so you can probably get one length of the stuff for free. Um, by bonded, he means that the two tubes are, are joined together. You have to, like, like zippered. You have to uh, tear them apart if you want, but they're always running two off the U that comes in. Yeah, so it's easy to make a nicer runs if they come in pairs. Yeah, yeah, sorry guys, sorry, we'll go on. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Thank you. So, good luck. Cause yeah. it, it's hard, because a lot of these things, just the answer is more work. And you're like, oh man. But um, that's. The, the bright side is there is results for more work, right? Like there are places where you can put some more effort and, and not focus so much on absolute performance, but focus on reliability and the end result will be better. Um, these presentations are going to be available for... Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the slides are going to be posted. Yeah. Are you also, if you have any questions or need some assistance during the, se the season, if you send us an email or something, yeah. then we can get back to you. And we also run the Robodrome, which was sort of... Mentioned yeah. by What's the best email to reach you at? Celtics Robotics. Celtics Robotics. Or just if we have a webpage too, 540 Ah, that's a good question. You should be able to. Celtics Robotics. You're welcome. Are you look, looking you forward to the second season? Chris, you another yeah. card? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe. A struggle, but uh, hey. So, is this good? So we're, uh, we're up to now five battle okay. so far. That's awesome. Um, we can do one uh, for from about eight like tunes to about thirty five. That's awesome. <laughs> that's what's on our list. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a good number. You can do that with five minutes. For sure.